Hey, welcome back to Wounded for War, guys. Uh, we're going to be jumping back in to Acts chapter 1, starting in verse 15. Last week, we talked about how uh, the Peter and, and the 12 were waiting on God, and, and that um, we could be proactive in prayer and waiting. And in, in that time, um, it's important to know that uh, they were seeking the Lord for his will and praying and waiting for the promise that um, of the Holy Spirit coming upon them so that they would be empowered to go do the will of, uh, of Jesus that had said that you're to go out and make disciples. Now, uh, what we're going to find in our study today is that um, as we wait and as we're praying, uh, we could make the mistake of getting ahead of God. Um, we're going to see in this account where Peter is uh, with the 120. He's waiting and, and they're waiting and they're praying. Um, but he chooses to move out in a direction. And we're going to start in verse, first, uh, verse 15. So let's do that. But before we do, let's go ahead and pray real quick. Father, I just want to ask that you would speak during this time, that your Holy Spirit would author our thoughts and help us to understand your word. Lord, that you would um, teach us. Your word is, um, is a wonderful tool, but we need your spirit to do the work in our hearts of revealing to us the areas where we need to grow. And so we pray that you would do that now in Jesus' name. Amen. So jumping into verse 15, it says, At this time, Peter stood up in the midst of the brethren, about 120, and said, Brethren, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit foretold through David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus, for he was counted among us and received his share in this ministry. Now this man acquired a field with the price of his wickedness, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his intestines gushed out. And it became known to all who were in uh, living in Jerusalem, so that in their own language, the field was called Hekeldama, or the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms. Now, let's pause right there. He starts to quote uh, an area of Psalms. This is Peter. He knows the scripture. He says, for it is written in the book of Psalms. And Psalm, uh, he, the psalm that he's quoting from is 69.25. And it says, let his homestead be made desolate. Then he quotes from another psalm, Psalm 109, verse 8. Let another man take his office. Now, let's pause there for a minute. I do believe that Peter was receiving instructions from the Lord as he's praying. They're praying. They're all seeking the Lord. And, and he gets these two um, scriptures as word from the Lord. Now, I believe that's of him. But what do we do when we get a word from the Lord of direction? Do we just jump out and go do it? Um, or do we wait still on the rest of the instructions? The Maybe the when. He got the what to do. How about the when? Or how to do it? This is going to be a problem we see with this situation. The next thing that he does reveals that that nature that Peter has, he's always jumping ahead. He's opening his mouth a little bit too quick and saying things he shouldn't. You know, he could be a little bit messy at times. Maybe that kind of describes you. And I know it describes me for sure. There's times where I have gotten ahead of the Lord simply because I just, I, I heard from him. I want to do something for him. Well, waiting on the rest of the instructions can be again, somewhat frustrating uh, because maybe we don't know how to hear from the Lord. Um, you might be asking, 
at this moment. Like, how do you hear from the Lord? What are the things that we need to do um, to hear the rest of the instructions that he gives us, right? Well, uh, I'd like to give you a few areas in scripture that talk about how we can hear from God in those waiting times. In 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 11 through 13, uh, we see Elijah, and in the story, he's, we're gonna take it uh, at, at uh, a certain point, uh, 11, but before that, he's complaining. He's basically saying, God, they've all turned their back on you. Everyone's turned their back on you. I'm the only one, and they're sort of trying to kill me too. So he's, he's kind of a bit of a whiner in the moment. And, and yet God still works with them. What does he say? He says, go out and stand before me on the mountain. The Lord told him, and Elijah, and as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks tore loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was a sound of a gentle whisper. Then Elijah heard it. He wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And the voice said, what are you doing here, Elijah? So. In this account, we see that um, really it's, it's a soft, still voice. Uh, we know it now as uh, in the New Testament as the, the voice of the Holy Spirit. Uh, that the Lord literally can lead you through uh, an encounter where it's a soft, still voice deep in you that, Lord, I need this uh, answer and I need to know, do I marry this guy or do I marry this guy or do do I get married at all? or, or do I take this job or do I not take this job? He can lead you by literally speaking still to you in that soft, still voice. It's one of the ways that he often leads me. Um, but there's also other ways. In Acts uh, chapter 10, verse 9 through 16, we see this moment where Peter, um, he's up on the top of the roof and uh, he's waiting for a meal to be uh, prepared for him. And in that time, it says that he was praying. And while he's praying, it says that he fell into a trance. Now, I don't wanna be uh, unclear here. That word trance is actually, uh, translates best to a vision, a vision or a dream type of thing. And, and we know that there's scriptures that talk about um, in, in the promise that they were talking about earlier in Joel, uh, where he says, uh, you, basically, your young men will have visions and your old men will dream dreams. And so we know that he can speak through a vision or a dream. In this case with Peter, there was uh, this, this blanket basically uh, being let down from heaven and, and there was all kinds of animals on there, clean and unclean to the Jewish culture. And he's, and he's like, uh, hey, uh, take it and eat it. And it, Peter's like, no, 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 Lord, I can't eat that. And it, it's unclean. Nothing ever unclean has ever touched my lips. Well, the Lord says, hey, don't call unclean what I call clean. And so in that moment, he's given him a vision of what um, essentially will then go on for him to understand that he was uh, called to not treat the Jews and Gentiles differently. So he spoke to him through that vision. There's also in uh, 2 Timothy, I'm going to pull that up. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17 are a great place um, that we can understand God's, um, God's will through his word. And here it says, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. So the word of God itself to get into scripture is super important. Now, I would say on a daily basis uh, is, is a best practice, um, but start wherever you need, get into the word and let it get into you. 
we often um, just read it as maybe a, a narrative or, or a, a history story, but the truth is we're, we really want it to be tucked into our hearts and for it to speak into those areas that are maybe a little bit dark, you know? Uh, I know that there's been times where I get into the scripture and I'm wrestling with how I'm treating somebody or how I acted and, and I read in the scripture that um, I'm to be gentle with people or loving and kind, or I look at the model of who Jesus is and the word of God just reveals to me, I'm not like that yet. And I need a lot of growth. How about in Proverbs? Proverbs is a, a, a whole book of wisdom, but in particular in Proverbs 15, 22, it says wisdom is found in a multitude of counsel. Now, you gotta be careful on this one because we often like to surround ourselves with people that are like-minded or think like us, or they're, they're um, a yes men type thing mentality, right? And so we wanna make sure that it's wisdom coming from a multitude of counsel that is wise counsel, um, that's godly counsel. Someone that you look at and, and you say, their life reflects um, the person and work of Jesus. Uh, I see in scripture, the same thing I see in their life. And I, I need to learn and grow from them. So you can pick people like that and, and get a, a, a consensus from people in general of that nature and say, you know, hey, it seems to be that four out of the five were saying that they, they see in my life, this is another factor is that some, pick someone that knows you, knows your life, understands your calling so that they can go, I, I, I see that. I can see that move in your life that you guys need to move here. It seems like that's where God's been leading you. And, and then all of a sudden, there's four out of five people telling you the same thing. You can gain some wisdom there. Also, um, I would say uh, circumstances can be a way that God leads you. Now, we have a, an account in scriptures. It's Numbers, it's in the book of Numbers. It's uh, in chapter 22. Uh, I'll let you read this. It's verse 21 through 39. It's the story of Balaam and his donkey. And essentially, this, this, this account goes like this. Uh, Balaam is heading out in a direction that God's not pleased with. And he sends an angel to stand in front of him and block him from going into this little cat, uh, cannon, canyon. And so the donkey sees the angel. Balaam's blinded to the whole matter and he's just, let's go, let's go. And the donkey sits down and he beats the donkey. And essentially after three times different accounts of beating this donkey, the Lord uses a quite an interesting uh, circumstance to get his attention. And what it was is he literally gave words to speak to the donkey and the donkey speaks to Balaam and says, why are you beating me? Have I ever done things like this? I'm your donkey. Have I acted ever like this? And he still, he argues with this donkey until finally the Lord has to open Balaam's eyes to see the angel in front of him that had a sword drawn ready to just annihilate him. So that's quite a strange account. However, uh, he can use uh, circumstances in, in our, maybe our day and age, how would that apply or how would that look? Maybe it's not a donkey, maybe your car breaks down, right? And you were headed to this job and you thought that God's will for you was to be at this place and, and be working there and, and maybe God uh, allows your car to break down so that you can't make that appointment. And, and that was God's way of working through circumstances. Um, or uh, maybe in this case, today and age, you know, you, you think this guy's the perfect guy for you, uh, yet all of a sudden it, it's revealed to you that, you know, right before you were thinking about getting married to this guy, um, that he has uh, some major problems in his finances that he doesn't know how to manage money and and that's going to be a danger for you down the road and so god revealed that to you so that you could actually understand that that's maybe not the guy for you so 
the voice of the Holy Spirit can speak to us and guide us. We can also receive visions or dreams. It's the way that he can guide us. Uh, we know that if we're in God's word, he can use that to guide us. We can also get um, guidance through wise counsel and he can work through circumstances. One common thread through all of these though, is that you're drawing near to God. You see in James 4, uh, eight through 10, it says that uh, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. It's a promise. You can hold on to that promise that if you draw near and you're seeking him in these ways, he's going to lead you. He's gonna draw near to you. You see the problem with not seeking God's will, God's way, is we substitute it with man's way. This leads to man's results. Let's take a look at Peter and how he rushes ahead of God. In verse 21, it says, Therefore, it is necessary that of the men whom have accompanied us all through the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning with the baptism of John until the day that he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they put forth two men, Joseph and Matthias, and they prayed and said, Lord, who, the Lord who knows the heart of all men, show us which one of these two you've chosen to occupy the ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they drew lots for them. And the lot fell on Matthias. And he was added to the 11 apostles. The first thing that we see here is that Peter assumes that God has, has to use someone that's just like them. That's a big problem. We do this all the time. In church movements, um, the person has to have the same type of education we have. They have to have, they have to look a certain way, just like us, they have to act a certain way. But the reality is, is God can use and will use people we don't expect. In this case, Matthias was, was chosen by literally a lottery, right? But we never hear about Matthias again. This is the first and the last time we ever hear about him. However, we know the clear choice of the 12th apostle who God chose, and that's Paul the apostle. Paul was a chosen vessel, and we know that because of book, the, the uh, book of Acts in chapter 9, we see the encounter with Paul and with God. In verse 15 of chapter 9, it says, But the Lord said, Go, for Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings and to the people of Israel. That's God's chosen vessel to be the 12th apostle. Now, truth is, proof's in the pudding. I mean, Paul wrote most of the New Testament. He did most of the missionary work going throughout um, all over the place, uh, sharing the gospel and starting churches, church planting. So I guess the question is, when you're waiting on God, are you waiting in, a, in the right manner? Are you waiting in a posture of prayer? And are you seeking him in those ways? Wisdom and a multitude of counsel? Are you, are you drawing near to God so that he could draw near to you? Are you, are you seeking him um, through his word? You know, those are the times that we grow the most. I know in my own uh, life, uh, there's a, a few times that I can say we've gotten, my wife and I, uh, when we shut down our business in Southern California, we got away for a weekend. 
And really, it you know, it wasn't to go vacation. It was, it was, we got away and we spent time in a hotel room and we literally got on our face and spent time in prayer and asked him, Lord, what's next? And my wife and I, I had heard after a while, I had heard, moved to Washington. And what was funny is my wife, literally, I didn't say anything. My wife said, hey, I think we're supposed to move to Washington. God met us in that time, met us in that place. And I got a dozen other times where it was uh, not me seeking. You know, it was, I was more like Peter where literally I jumped out in front of, you know, what God had for me. There was another time um, where through circumstances uh, and through a dream uh, that God had led me. There was a time where in my business in Southern California, a uh, partner had robbed me blind and, and, and really bad. And we weren't going to be able to survive and um, had no cash flow. Basically, he had drained the bank accounts. And uh, I didn't know what to do. So I cried out to God. And I'm, I mean, literally bawling my eyes out in my car because I have families that are dependent on me and for payroll and all. And, and so I'm just crying out to God. God heard my cry. And I literally got a call from a guy I didn't know. I was going to a church and I was in leadership, but I didn't know the elder board um, and who was behind, uh, you know, all that. And so, but I get, I get this call from this guy and, and he's, he says to me, uh, hey, I heard the situation about what happened. And uh, what would it take for you to get back on your feet? I said, honestly, about $100,000. And uh, and he said, well, as we were sleeping last night, my wife woke up and said that the Lord clearly spoke to her and said, you're to help these people out. And so he, I guess, uh, was seeking out my name and information from the pastors. And next thing you know, I get the call and he says, hey, Okay, um, we're gonna get you that check. Now, I don't know about you, man, but I've never seen someone fork out a hundred grand for no reason. That was a miracle. A dream that she had received and literally he met me through that circumstance. So maybe that's encouraging to you. And I just wanna pray that God would Definitely grow you in this area so that you can actually get whenever God calls you into to a place of, of difficulty, you can get that counsel that's needed. You can get that um, you can get that perfect will that he wants for you. So, Father, I come before you and I pray for the people that will be watching this. Lord, first off, I thank you for them. And I pray, God, that you would bless them and encourage them through this message. That Lord, you would give them tools, these practical tools, Lord, to waiting and seeking your will and, and knowing what you want. That they can please you, be directed in their life, in directions that lead to fruitfulness, lead to your, your will being done, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that you have brought about these things in my life, taught me through the years how to wait upon you, how to see you magnified and glorified by me, clearly listening and obeying. Thank you, Lord. Be with them, encourage them, strengthen them, and give them clarity for your will in their life. I love you and I praise you and I ask all this in Jesus' name, by your authority, Lord. Amen. Until next week, I love you guys. See you soon.